morning. Um, so our passage today is from 2 Kings. We're going to be reading a good long passage here. There's so many verses, in fact, um, we just can't put it all up on the screen. We'd be flipping through it forever. So if you have your Bibles, if you can open them to 2 Kings 5, please do so. If not, uh, just stand and, and re- listen anyways as we read the first, I think we'll read uh, the first uh, 15 verses here. 2 Kings 5. Now hear the word of the Lord. Now Naaman was commander of an army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master, highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now the bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes. He said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message, Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there was a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. But Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became as clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and he said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. May God bless this reading of his word today. Please have a seat. It's weird to think that not too very long ago, a lot of us saw things like family reunions as a trying experience, something to be avoided. And now I think we give our eyes teeth just to have a good one. I was uh, reading through quotes on on this, and one stuck out at me. The comedian Renee Hicks said that a family reunion is that time when you go and you visit your family tree, and you realize that a lot of these branches should be cut off. I imagine that when COVID's over, there's going to be a lot of family reunions, a lot of people coming back together, friendships, people who just haven't been in each other's presence for a long time. We're going to see great and small reunions. So many people have been kept apart from this past year, and that's really painful to us. I was thinking of yesterday, just how many people from Knox, I haven't seen my family here at Knox, I haven't seen for the better part of a year, and that, that hurts me. I, I miss being in their presence. And I understand why, but I miss them. And I can't wait for the day where we'll have a reunion. There's just something about that personal connection of being close to somebody that Facebook and Zoom can't replicate, isn't there? Well, for some of us, we feel distant from God in much the same way at times in our life. We feel far away from God, have that feeling like we've just got that emotional distance where we're you know, talking to God, we sort of believe in God, but we're far from him. And as the saying goes, well, if you ever feel far from God, guess who moved, right? It's always us. But what I love about God is that he always desires 
that moment of reunion. He always wants to bring us back together with him. He wants to make sure he can pave the way so that we can come back. And that's why I find this story here in 2 Kings 5 with Naaman very instructive. Because here in this story it contains three very common barriers, common obstacles that we erect to set us some distance between us and God. Reasons why we're not praying, why we're not going to church, why we're not talking to him, why we feel far from him. And we see all three of these here in 2 Kings 5, and also how God helps name and helps us smash through these barriers to return to him. So let's look at that today. Let's actually meet Naaman. If I ever was going to market a line of Bible action figures become rich, I'll, I'm going to put that for next year's to do. I, I, Bible action figures, you'd want to collect Naaman. Naaman would want to be one of your guys in your collection. I love this guy. I think he could be a bestseller. He's, he's strong. He's brave. He's talented. Everybody in the world, I mean, they think the world of him. They love him. He's, he's very respected by everybody in this country. His king is the, his best friend. I mean, he, Naaman's got it made. Anytime he goes into battle, he wades out of that battle with success and glory. And we actually find out why, because right there in verse 1 it says that he's doing all this because the Lord was working in his life. I find that very interesting, that Naaman is not a Jew. He's not part of the, the Jewish heritage of Israel. And yet, even back in the Old Testament, God works through non-Jews. God works through the Rahabs and the Naamans. He works through people's life for his purpose, and it's really cool. So everything was going Naaman's way. He had it all made, except for one massive personal tragedy. That was Naaman had leprosy. And reading the, those couple words there, those first couple of sentences, you can almost just skip past it and realize that you, that's like somebody crashing down on you, hearing, you have cancer or you just lost somebody in your life. That's an enormous thing to be told, especially back then, you have leprosy. Because there was no cure. Absolutely no cure. He knew that it was just a matter of time before those little red spots would become big, scaly, white ones, where his hair and his teeth would fall out, where his fingers and toes would blacken and become dead flesh, and where he would spend the rest of his short days in agony before dying. That's all he had to look forward to in his future. Pain, disfigurement, abandonment by everybody who loved him right now, and death. Meet Naaman's servant. A young girl, we unfortunately don't get her name. I really do wish we did, because I think she's one of the heroes of the Old Testament right here. This young girl, she was captured. As she was going home one day, a raid from this foreign nation came in. They grabbed her, threw her onto the back of a donkey, carried her off and put her into an indentured servitude for the rest of her life. She would never see her family again. She'd never smell home again. She'd never eat those familiar foods again. She was abandoned. In both of these situations, we see great personal tragedy. And that's the first obstacle we have that sometimes gets between us and God when a big personal tragedy comes into our life. And at that point, we look at what's going on, we look at a life taken away from us, maybe somebody else's life, maybe something that's irrevocably changed in our own. And we usually pray this to God. We say, why? Or sometimes we go, why? And sometimes our next question is, how dare you? Why, God? What did I ever do to you? Why would you do this to me? Why would you let this happen to me? Your faithful servants, right? You start trotting out your resume. God, I went to church, you know, uh, 30 times last year, and I gave, and I did all this stuff. Why would you let this personal tragedy come to me? And then there grows that anger and that resentment against God. But as Romans 8, 28 lovingly reminds us, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Naaman was called to God's purpose. This young woman was called to God's purpose. They couldn't see it at the time of their tragedy. That tragedy was just blinding. It was overwhelming. Naaman's looking forward to his future and seeing nothing there. The woman is looking back at her past and saying, I can't ever have that again. But at this time, they're allowed to suffer tragedy for the purpose of God. And that is always really hard for us 
when that comes into our life, why God allows that tragedy. But he says, I'm not going to let you suffer this pain for no reason. I will take that pain and I will use it for a good purpose. These two tragedies here in 2 Kings 5, very interesting because they start to entwine, right? They connect together and we see how God works through them both. God gives us this story so that while we can't see in our own life why tragedy happens, what's going to happen next, we can actually chart minute by minute through the life of Naaman how God works through this tragedy for his purpose. And we see how the servant girl, even in slavery, even as she has a reason to curse God, she clings to her faith. Even though she has every reason to hate Naaman, to hate the man, that she's a servant under that represents everything this country ever did to her. She has every reason to hate him. Yet through her faith, she loves him. She shows God to him. And that makes her a hero in my eyes. That she would stand up and say, instead of hating you, I love you and I want you to get better. I want to point you toward healing. I want to point you toward God. God put this young woman in this situation for his purpose and his glory, to put point Naaman toward God in a lot, through Elisha. So as for Naaman's tragedies, it's like a lot of us. When bad things happen, we're willing to grasp at straws. We're willing to do anything. There's even a chance at healing. So he goes to the king, and the king, who loves Naaman dearly, also leaps at that chance. He loads up some poor donkey with a ridiculous amount of money. We're talking like $1.2 million worth of gold and silver loaded down and sends it off just on a chance, just a chance he could be healed. Sends him off to a foreign country with that much money, hopefully some guards around it. Naaman's personal tragedy starts him on a journey toward God. And sometimes God uses tragedy in our lives to send us back to him. And that's hard for, that is a really hard lesson. It's not something we wish on each other. But it's also something at the end of the day you can look back and say, it was hard to go through, but I praise God. Because through that, God did a great thing. Through that, God led me back to him. Through that, God's will, his purpose is fulfilled. God can take the worst the world has to offer, and he takes that defeat, and he turns it into victory. And that's what we see right here. Now I have another question for you. Have you ever tried to strike a bargain with God? How'd that work out for you? Not too well, I expect. God doesn't really like it when you try to go and strike bargains with him. And this is why. Because he's holding all the chips. He has everything. Like there's nothing you can offer to God that he doesn't already have the full right to. So that kind of gets us off on a wrong foot when we go to God and say, God... I want you to do something, and I want you to do it in a very particular way, and I'm willing to give you my firstborn child. Some days I'm willing to give God all four of my kids. <laughs> right? I'm willing to give you whatever you want. I'm willing to become a nun. I'm willing to, to you know, even go to church next week. Whatever, you know, instead of seeing the Bills game. Anything, God. Anything. I'll give it to you. But that's not how God wants us to, to interact with him. God doesn't take orders from us. He doesn't take our expectations. He works in ways that are frankly sometimes strange and counterintuitive to what we think is best. And I want you to, that to sink into you. What we think is best. You see, sometimes we go to God and we say, God, I want you to do something that I think is best. That my wisdom should overshadow yours. My thinking, my expectations are better than anything you could come up with, God. So I want you to do what I want. I want to overrule you. That creates a barrier of arrogance. It creates a barrier of expectations. Now, let's look at how that works out for our hero here. Naaman here, very interesting journey. I'd like to see a movie. Maybe there is a new movie. I don't know. Where Naaman goes to Israel, and as he's on his way, the king of Israel back then, he's scared to death. He gets word that this incredibly successful hero, this general, is on his way to meet him. And of course, this, this king, who is not a man of God at all, this King Joram here, is convinced that, I don't know why, this guy is going to attack him with his donkey full of money. I mean, he's just, that's, that's what he assumes. So he rips his clothes. That's a sign of extreme grief 
And he sends a guy who's like, please get out of here. Go away. If you're not going to attack me, just go. I don't want to have anything. I can't help you. Go away. Sends him away. So our displeased general, he just kind of shrugs, and he turns away and he goes to the only person who can actually help him, this prophet. And as Naaman's traveling toward the house of Elisha, and he gets to his front doorstep, something really interesting happens, doesn't it? The prophet sends a messenger out to meet Naaman. He sends him a note, basically. He passes him a note in class. He says, in that letter, he, he instructs Naaman to do something very mundane. He says, Naaman, dear Naaman, go to the river, dunk yourself seven times, you'll be healed. Elisha. You know, that's it. He gets this letter, and Naaman absolutely loses his temper. He loses his temper because his expectations are not met. What was he expecting? He was expecting Elisha to receive him as everybody else had ever received this guy, Naaman. They fell on their feet before him. They praised his name. They were in awe of him. He was like a cel the celebrity of this country. And he was just used to that treatment. He expected Elisha to come out and to do a little magic show over him, to wave a hand over him, beams of light coming down from heaven, and maybe Naaman would be lifted up and you know, twirled around, and stars would come down, and, and, and the leprosy would just sprinkle off of him. And so Elisha sends him a note, go wash in the river. And Naaman's like, if I wanted to go, did this guy just tell me to go jump in a lake? Seriously, if I wanted to go wash in a river, we got way nicer rivers back home. That's what he says right there, isn't it? We've got nicer rivers back home if this is what I wanted to do. Go wash in a river. His expectations are not met. This God of Israel is a big disappointment. It's a waste of his time. He's pulling his leg. Brothers and sisters, God wants us to expect great things. He wants us to pray great prayers. Don't let this stop you. I'm not saying don't expect great things. God, just expect them in the right way. And don't demand that God do it on your timetable and in the fashion of your choosing. Because God may say, that's not the way I want to work. I have a better way, a more wise way, and you're going to have to trust me. Here, Naaman expected the King Joram to receive him. He expected a, a mighty magic show from Elisha. He gets neither one of those. He gets a letter of simple instructions. God's miracles aren't often showy, are they? Sometimes they're small. Sometimes they're mundane. But they are profound and powerful. They're as powerful as a little baby being born in a manger. Back when I went to seminary, I had a friend named Joe. Joe, I, I forget what country he came from, but he grew up in a small country in Africa, one of those countries that was just torn by civil war. And that's the environment he grew up in. You think things are bad here. He grew up seeing his friends and family killed all the time. He said, I grew up, and as I was growing up, he gave his testimony at our seminary. He said, as I was growing up, I kept questioning God. Why would you allow this to happen? Why would you let these people be killed? Why would you take them away from me? And I got mad because God wouldn't answer my question. But then over time, Joe said, I learned to trust and obey a sovereign God. That even though I didn't know why he was doing what he was doing, I knew he was still God. He still had a sovereign hand over all things. And I could just learn to trust him. And Joe eventually put aside his expectations and started embracing that trust and that obedience. And he finally heard God's call to be a pastor. And he realized at that moment that God had been training him to get rid of those, that, that false expectations of prayer instead forming a humble servant of the Lord. And Joe was praising God you know, as he gave this testimony. Do we trust and obey God? Or do we demand that God act according to our expectations? Do we say, God, I'll follow you only until you do something I don't like. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head off. You know, God, I'll do this nice thing for you if in return you'll do something nice for me. Not how God works. We're to humble ourselves. We're to pray, God, your will, not mine. What do you want me to do, God? Increase my faith, Lord. Help me to trust you. Several years ago, 
I was visiting an apple orchard, and it was one of those brilliant fall days that right now is so far away from our memory. A brilliant, nice fall day, and we were riding on a, a hay cart as it was coming back from apple picking, and I had my nice basket of juicy apples there. And we heard something really disturbing. We, saw, we heard this scream, and this woman was running the opposite way down the lane. And she ran right by our car, and we said, something's going on. So a few of us jumped off the car, and we ran after her, like, what's going on? And she ignored us, and she kept calling out a name. She said, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy! And we're like, we saw nobody. And then finally we hear, Mom! And out of this tall field of corn bursts a little boy. See, this little boy had gotten lost in one of those big corn mazes, wandered way out off into the, the deeps of the corn fields, and the, the mother had lost him. And she was frantic, and he was crying. He had no idea where to go, because from his perspective, from a kid who's this tall, can't see anything past all that corn. And so he's just lost. He's lost literally in the weeds, right? Lost in the corn. And it wasn't until he heard the voice of his mom that he found a way out. And that right there is us and our biggest obstacle. Our biggest obstacle between us and God doesn't tend to always be personal tragedy or expectations. But the biggest obstacle, the one we can't see over, is our sin. It's a sin where we're lost right in the middle of it. We can't get out of it. We've been stuck in it forever. Some of us get really stubborn and we just fold our arms and we say, well, I'm comfortable here. I'm just going to set up shop. This is where I'm going to live for the rest of my life. This is home. But then we hear a voice. And a voice calls to us. It says, I'm out here. Come to me. Come to me. Get out of that sin. Let me show you the way. When that little boy came out of those, that corn maze, and his mother and him, they slammed together in one of those hugs that you thought they would never let each other go. They had that reunion. And that's the moment God is looking forward to with us. Right here in, with Naaman's story, we see how his sin rears its ugly head at this very moment. And his sin is the same sin that all of us very strongly relate to. It's the sin of pride. He is a very proud man. He is a man who's used to people bowing to him, used to getting that respect, having his dignity, having his ego stroked. He was just used to all of that. And through this experience, he was asked to humble himself. And he couldn't do it. He turned away. He was going to go home. If uh, all things being equal, if nobody had said anything, he would have gone home and died horribly because he couldn't get past his sin. But he heard a voice. He heard a voice calling out to him as he's lost in the middle of that sin. And God's voice comes out of his servants. And his servants say, Naaman, you idiot. Naaman, come on. If you had gone to this man, Elisha, and he asked you for some grand, huge task like Hercules, you know, go cut down this forest, go roll a boulder up a hill, slay 20 bears, you would have done it. You would have felt like you earned that healing. You would have done it, no problem. He's asking you for something mundane. He's asking you for, to humble yourself. Why aren't you doing this simple task? And in that moment, I love the fact that we see how Naaman doesn't remain, as so many of us, so many people I know do, where they remain very stubborn in their sin. Somebody confronts them with their sin, they go, so what? I'm staying right here. I'm going home. I'm going to die horribly. Forget you. Naaman doesn't do that. Instead, in that moment, he hears the voice of God and he runs toward him. He humbles himself. He says, you're right. You're absolutely right. My big fat ego is getting in my way of just doing what I should do. And so he goes down to the river. He humbles himself. Seven dips later, and his skin is clear. He's healed. And I love that this, there's a parallel here with this story. And later in the New Testament, in the Gospels, when they lower that paralyzed man down through the ceiling. Remember that? And all his friends wanted Jesus to do was to heal him. To heal his physicality. To heal his lameness and make him walk again. But what does God prioritize in both of these stories? The healing of the soul first. That he wants Naaman to repent first. He wants to forgive that man's 
sins first. The healing, it's almost an afterthought. It's almost a, yeah, okay, you know, you, you got the most important thing out of the way. I'll do this too. God likes to pour on blessing. But that repentance, that humbling, that fleeing back to God, the repenting of Naaman, that's what saves him. That's what brings him back together. Just like that mother and son, Naaman flees into the arms of God and he makes this profound statement here in 2 Kings 5. He says, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except the one in Israel. In this moment, Naaman is saved. He has, con- he has repented, he has confessed of his sins, and he has confessed that Jesus Christ, even though he doesn't know his name, is Lord. And that, is, that always gives me chills when I see that moment. Because someday, brothers and sisters, we will meet Naaman in heaven. And he's going to tell us of this story right from his mouth. At the time when he, a non-Jew, was called from God, and God called him out of that big thicket of sin that he had been in his whole life. And call him out into the clear, and where he got to be reunited with the God that loves him so dearly. So, my question is what is getting between you and God this week? Maybe it's nothing. Maybe you're, you're really good with God right now, but it could be that you have a personal tragedy, some hardship in your life, something you're really struggling with, and you're struggling with why God's allowing that. And I don't off, I'm not giving you an easy answer to that, I don't want to give you a trite answer to it. But I will say God is there. God understands your pain. God is not going to let that pain be without purpose. Is it our expectations that are getting between us and God, that we've been expecting God to do something for so long, and he hasn't done it yet, or he hasn't done it in the way we expect him to? He hasn't answered our prayers just right. Maybe at that point we need to be getting over our arrogance and praying in a different way. Your will your will, God. God, you invite us to come to you with our requests. I'm going to make my request to you, but in the end, your will be done, not mine, because your will is more wise, better, has a better perspective, and it is good. Let me trust in you. Maybe that barrier getting between us and God is our sin. It's an unrepented sin in our life. It's a sin where we're so entrenched in it, maybe we don't even see it until somebody points it out. One of our brothers and sisters points it out to us and says, do you see how much you've been sinning? Do you hear God calling you? Run back to him. That time of confession we have every morning when we, we have this time on Sunday mornings of prayer of confession, the time when we humble ourselves. Up here, down there, we're together because I'm always praying to God, God, show me my sin. Show us our sin. Because I I don't want to have it in my life anymore. And I'm so sad that I had this this past week. But going forward, I want less of it and less of it and less of it. Because every time I sin, it's just making this barrier, this distance between me and you. And I want to be close to you. I want you to be close with God. Naaman's story is a great way, just an encouraging way. It wasn't easy for him to go on this journey. He had to struggle with a lot of things. This young servant girl had to struggle with a lot. But in the end... When you open yourself up with pr- pr- in prayer, when you dive into the Word, when you reconnect with God, you have that reunion where He throws His arms around you and tells you, I'm never letting you go. And you throw your arms around God and say, God, I'm never going to let you go. We can declare as Naaman did. We can say, there is no God in all the world except my God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for the story of Naaman for his faults and his faith, for this young servant girl's faith. Lord, thank you for how much you put this on display to encourage us in our lives. I know sometimes we often hear, I'm just so far away from God. I don't know where God is in my life. Sometimes, Lord, I'm feeling that way. And we know in all these places, you are right there, right next to us, and we need to see you, we need to hear you, we need to feel you, we need to encounter you. And I just pray that we be able to get through some of these very common barriers, uh, barriers of expectations, of sin, of tragedy. Lord, we can just be in your presence so we can rest, we can heal, we can learn, and we can love you. Lord, in all these things, we just, again, invite you into our week. We invite you into this church this week. That, Lord, we are broken people that are being healed by a merciful Savior. 
we are on our journey with you, and we're just excited to be doing that together. Um, I pray that this church would be a church of people who would look at each other and realize we've all been wounded. We've all had hardships that when one of us stumbles, the rest of us can just surround them and pick them back up, not point fingers, not accuse, but, Lord, to lift them up with our prayers and with our encouragement. I pray that that would be this kind of church. That's my big prayer this week, Lord. I expect it, but however you want it to happen, your will be done, your name, amen. I'm thankful that I didn't have leprosy, but I had someone tell me and use a visual of, of garbage in our life, that we were stuck with this smelly, gross condition that we couldn't fix on our own. But the beauty of the gospel is that's not where we're left. Naaman wasn't left with his leprosy. He was given an opportunity to encounter the living God who heals and saves the same way that I was in sixth grade. And I'm grateful that that garbage, I'm no longer a stinky, smelly mess, but I've been redeemed by Jesus who died for my sins and loves me. And it's in his name that I pray you go in peace, be blessed, and we'll see you guys next week.